Well, hello, welcome to our service for Clement Parish Church, Sunday the 15th of August. My name is Gordon Palmer, and as well as myself taking part in the service, Wynne Baden will be leading us in our prayers for others, and it's in Alison Ross who's doing the signing this week. We come not because we are worthy, we come knowing we are unworthy, but we come in confidence because our God is a God who transforms, who makes things new. In the book of Revelation, the Lord seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. He does that for us because He loves. Everyone needs compassion is our first item of praise. Let's join together in prayer and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. The words of that that we use will be in the screen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Lord and our God, the creator of all, the maker of heaven and earth, we are stunned at the wonder of your creation, baffled by its teeming stars and planets, by all its mysteries, even just life on this one planet on which we live is way beyond what we could imagine, far less understand. And you sustain it all. And in the midst of all that, we might feel not worth much. We might feel insignificant or worthless, except we hear the beat of your heart in all things. And we can say with a psalmist, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. And so you have given us a great privilege, a great place in looking after your world, placed us at the center of your purposes, And you have come to us through your Son, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who walked on earth for us, who, who wept with us and died for us. Because, Lord, we had spoiled that good creation. We had turned from you, and we needed things to be made new again. Renewal, new life was beyond us. Forgiveness was not something we could buy or purchase. Restoration and fellowship with you was not something we could bargain for. No, once more, we were simply dependent on your mercy. And yet, though you have shown such mercy, and though it came at great cost in Christ becoming one of us, and though time and time again through your Spirit you have reached out to us, so often we have chosen the old ways, rejected your offer of salvation, your forgiveness. So, Lord, as we pray to you, search through your Spirit, search our hearts and minds. Remind us that we can keep nothing hidden from your gaze. And remind us, too, that though there is much there in us that is unworthy, you're the God who makes all things new, the God who restores. So today, might we know your forgiveness. Might we feel your pardon. Might we know our fellowship with you renewed, our hope restored. And might all of that help us live lovingly in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved and gave himself for us. And in his words, we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven. We are continuing our series in the book of Ezekiel, and last week in chapter 33, it was the news had come through to the exiles that Jerusalem itself had been captured and was in ruins. And that was the low point, in a sense, of um, their experience. But from that, Ezekiel began to uh, bring God's message of hope and of, of restoration and we <clears throat> reading this morning, picking up on, on that. First thing I'm going to read in chapter 36, uh, verses 22 to 28, and then the first 14 verses of chapter 37. So it's uh, Ezekiel chapter 36 at verse 22 through to 28. God speaks to Ezekiel, and he says, Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name that you have profaned among them. And then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. 
And then in chapter 37, um, <clears throat> verses 1 to 14, another of the visions that is given to Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared in them, and skin covered them but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood upon their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone, and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it declares the Lord. Amen, and may God bless the reading of his word to us. Now, I've never seen um, one of them right through, but I know from the TV schedules that there are many programs on TV about makeovers, about, you know, transforming old furniture into better looking stuff, transforming whole houses, and there's all the cosmetics, uh, cosmetic surgery, doing up gardens and so on and so on. And usually they finish with surprised and delighted people happy with the transformation. There is something fascinating to folk about it. Well, there, I suppose there must be, or nobody would make and watch all of these TV programs. <clears throat> but most of us, maybe in fact all of us, we, we know that changes are needed. We know that things could be different. And God knows that too. But he also knows what we often overlook that it's not just our rooms, our appearance, our wardrobe, our gardens that need to be different. We need to be different. Not just on the surface, not even with the, the new hips or the new knees or whatever it is we are dealing with, but a renewal of our whole selves, a salvation, not simply a makeover. Now, from the low point in chapter 33 in Ezekiel, where they heard about the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel's message fo focused more not on condemnation and judgment, but the, on the hope of salvation. There was a call in verse 11 of chapter 33 for the people to repent. But that was not all of the message. The gospel is not about how we are to, if we can, sort ourselves out so that God can start blessing us. That could never happen. 
Back in chapter 16, we looked at how the gospel is a message of grace, of God reaching out, God blessing the unworthy, God God coming to the overlooked, God helping those totally unable to help themselves. And in the passages we read for this morning in chapters 36 and 37, the focus is very much on what God does, on God's initiative. The people of Israel had failed miserably to be God's agents in the world. They had had failed to live up to His calling and His purposes. And it was going to take radical surgery, real deep transformation And that's what God was promising. The old stony hearts would be replaced with new living hearts. The old stubborn spirits replaced with God's life-giving spirit. Verse 26 of chapter 36. In fact, in these verses 24 to 26 of that chapter, six times between those four verses, God says, I will. Salvation is His work. It's what He does. We cannot produce from within the changes that are needed. We need new hearts. Because the heart of the human problem is the problem of a human heart. And something needs to be done with that. And the issues you see, not our occasional lapses or not letting aside down now and again, but a, a settled opposition to the ways of God an inability to think his thoughts, seek him first, live his way. And it's beyond us to renew ourselves inside out, beyond us to bring new life where there is death. The story of the prince picking up the discarded baby in chapter 16 was making exactly that point. Discarded child, weak, helpless, unable to do anything but he's loved by the Lord. And if it were not clear enough in the promises of um, chapter 36 in these verses where God said, I will, I will, I will, God follows that by this vision in chapter 37 of new life when things are seemingly beyond hope as Ezekiel is taken to the valley of dry bones. Now that valley would be a horrific place for Ezekiel to be. If we've seen anything like it, it will have been on our our screens, either on the film or television, the killing fields in Cambodia or the genocide in Rwanda or the what? Body upon body, bone upon bone, the whole thing just chucked away. A whole army had fallen and simply been left in the valley, and they'd been there a long time, for the bones were all old and dried out. Now, to a Jewish priest, and Ezekiel was a Jewish priest, as well as this being a tragic scenario, it was also a place of ritual defilement to be touching the dead. And here he is, verse 2 of chapter 37, being taken to and fro among the bones. And a question is put in the third verse, can these bones live? The answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? No, they can't. Bones don't have a future. But Ezekiel realizes that there must be something that the Lord has in mind asking him this question, and so he gives a non-committal answer. Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And the Lord indeed has something in mind. And so the command is given, verse 4, to Ezekiel, and it seems bizarre. He's to preach to these pile of bones. We know that ears have bones, but we also know that bones don't have ears. What's the point of preaching to them? This is even way beyond Jesus calling Lazarus out of the tomb after Lazarus had been dead for a few days. This is way beyond that. This is, this is years later, these dried out piles of bones, and Ezekiel doesn't have any magical words to offer. He doesn't have any spell to cast. He doesn't have anything other than the Word of God to share. And it's just the living power of the Word of the living God that invades the valley of death. And there is the astonishing response of the the bones taking shape, of the various bones finding the right one, a, a tibia finding a fibula that's the same size or whatever, as they all just put together in skeletal form and then are covered 
tendon and flesh and skin. And then the miracle of reconstruction stopped just as suddenly as it had begun. And verse 8, there was no breath in them. So, verse 9, Ezekiel's told to, to preach again. This time, not to the bones, but he's to preach to the breath, to the wind. Now, the Hebrew word for breath dominates this passage. It's used 10 times in these 14 verses, and it's used with a variety of meanings. In verse 1 and in verse 14, clearly it's a, a reference to the Holy Spirit of God. It's used as breath, literally our breath, in verses 5, 6, 8, and 10. And in verse 9, it refers to the wind. The whole scene is shot through, you see, with the various uses of wind and breath and spirit, but it clearly it's the work, the bringing life out of deadness is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this bringing the, the bones into a state of where they're in flesh, and then a second stage of the, the breath of God being breathed into them, is a reminder back to the creation story in Genesis chapter 2, but it was also a two-stage work. Humans were put together by God, and then secondly, the Spirit of God, the breath of God, entered them and brought life. And so, you see, the revival of Israel was to be nothing less than the recreation of the whole of humanity. It was a creative work of God on a par with the creation out of nothing itself. Now, it's an extraordinary vision. And the Lord didn't leave Ezekiel to guess what it meant, and Ezekiel didn't leave us in the dark either, for in verses 11 to 14 we have its, its meaning, its interpretation. The people of Israel, were told, were bereft of hope. They thought their whole identity and purpose were gone. Their, their hopes of a return to Jerusalem were, were ended. Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off, they say, verse 11. And it would be a work of God for, them, for that to be changed. And that is again the third time Ezekiel is told to speak, and this time it's to the people of Israel, how God is going to make the dead live, how God is going to bring light where there is darkness. God is going to do what seems impossible. He would bring life where there is only death. He will turn hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. He will restore and renew his people. And he would bring them back into fellowship with himself. I will settle you in your own land, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, he says. Now, we might look at a passage such as Ezekiel 36 and 37 and think, well, there is, there's nothing we can do. Um, we can't cut out our hearts of stone and put a heart of flesh in instead making these dead bones live kind of thing, that's, that's impossible. We're maybe just going to have to wait and see if the Lord turns up and does that kind of thing today. But that is not what Ezekiel was saying, and that is not what God through Ezekiel was teaching. There was a command to repent that I mentioned back in, in chapter 33. A response was needed. And the commands in chapters 37 include Ezekiel acting, Ezekiel doing something. And it shows that the Lord wants his people to serve, to be involved in his work. Jesus told his followers that the harvest fields were ripe, but it was the laborers that were needed. Luke chapter 10 at verse 2. Laborers, that is volunteers, and servants, workers, because God wants to include us. And chapter 37 is to say that no situation is so hopeless that the Word of God cannot get a response. And if there is to be a renewal among the people of God, it'll come through His Word being shared because it's only the Word of God that can wake the dead. Our task is not to make the dead live. Our task is to share and show Jesus. Our task is to make the Word, Jesus, who became flesh, 
enfleshed before other people. Show them Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Not a Jesus shorn of miracles, because that sounds too fantastic for the modern ear. Not a Jesus shorn of his uncomfortable words of judgment, because, well, that's a bit unpleasant. Not a Jesus who toned things down, or a Jesus who was commitment light. Rather, the Jesus that we find in the Gospels. That Jesus is the one that we are to reflect, and the one that we are called to follow, to resemble. And the gospel is not about the church, about how much we like what we do and others might like to join in. It is about making Jesus known. It is about the Word made flesh, being given flesh as we share Him. And we do that as we share the Word, as we share that Jesus story. But all the preaching and teaching and talking about Jesus will not bring about by itself needed salvation. It might move people to be a bit better, put some better shape into life, just as the pile of bones were formed into skeletons. But the breath, the Spirit of God is needed if there's to be life. Ezekiel was commanded to call on the Spirit to come. Firstly, he had a message to share with the people, but also he had something to say to the Spirit of God himself. So then God wants us to be part of things, but it's His Word, it's His Spirit that make the difference. And in all of this, perhaps the, one of the hardest lessons for Israel to learn and one of the hardest lessons for us today is that that work of God is, is not just for our sake. Ezekiel's message of hope and transformation was not only good news for Israel, but good news for the Lord as well. So back at verse 22 that we read from chapter 36, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. That's tough, isn't it? We so often get into a way of thinking about God as being there to sort things out for us, God being there to look after us, God, that's His job. But actually, His purposes are not we getting the, the makeover that we fancy, that we like things tarted up in a way that suits us. His purposes are for the glory of His own name. And it's dictated by two things, the, the holiness of the Lord, His reputation being restored, and the knowledge of God among the nations. Now, before Israel went into exile, both of these things were damaged by Israel's unfaithfulness. And the exile itself had been to deal with Israel's bad behavior, but it had not helped in terms of the Lord's reputation among the nations. The nations looked and thought, God, can he be very good? There's Israel being taken captive. But this work of restoration, this work of renewal was required so that the nations would see and that they would learn and that the Lord's name would be restored. People would know our God reigns. Now, Ezekiel 37, the picture of the Valley of Dry Bones, is not in the first instance about resurrection of the dead. It's a message from Ezekiel to the people of Israel in exile. It was about their feeling, verse 11, that the exile had killed them off as regard the purposes of God. It was to say that that was wrong, and God could, and God would restore them, even though they couldn't see a way out. God was a God of miracles. God was a God who could do the unlikely and the impossible. But nevertheless, this vision is an important link in a chain building towards the full biblical hope of resurrection. And much later, in a locked room, Jesus himself, freshly risen to his feet after death, summons both the posture of Ezekiel in calling for God's Spirit, and he takes the posture of God himself in sending the Spirit onto the disciples in John chapter 20. Jesus resurrected, fulfilled Ezekiel's vision of restoration. 
And that resurrection both glorified God and also was part of God's wider plan for the salvation of the world. And so in the next stage, his disciples were commissioned and empowered to be God's living agents and witnesses in the world, declaring that he is risen. Salvation was tied up with mission. You cannot be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit, and that same Spirit is the one who sends us into the world to proclaim and pray for God's sake and for God's kingdom. And so the gospel call is not a makeover to make us a wee bit more attractive, a bit comfortable, happier with how life looks. It may do that. But more. And it's not a makeover that improves things for a bit and then decay again sets in. It is the new life of God. It is a call to our place in God's purposes, to enjoy His salvation and His life. It is to enjoy what Jesus called abundant life. Such transformation involves us being changed, involves our hearts of stone becoming hearts of flesh. We can't do that. We can't get in an expert of three to do it for us, as happens in the makeover programs. But we do know someone who can and who does and who has time and again made that difference in life. The one who made the dead bones live. The one who breathes life. The one who changes hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. That's not beyond the Lord. And He's promised to do that to and for His people. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank You that the gospel is more than just a wee bit of self-improvement, a wee bit of sorting this or that out in the meantime, but a whole new work of new life, a, a promise into restoration and fullness of life such that we haven't yet known or enjoyed. Help us to trust Your promises. Help us to live with that biblical hope. Help us, Lord, to rely on You to, in Your grace, come and change and transform us but also help us to play our part in repenting, play our part in sharing about Jesus, play, play, our, play our part in praying to You to come and work and change. That, Lord, together You and we might see Your hand touching lives, transforming things, and Your kingdom coming. Amen. It's a new work of God, and so we sing the hymn, I Am a New Creation. After we've sung that, we'll uh, join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, Wynne will then lead us in our prayers for others, and then that hymn that declares that indeed our God reigns. How lovely on the mountains. God bless you.
I believe that Let us pray together. God of all creation, you hold the depths of the earth in your hands. You are closer to us than the air we breathe. Fill our souls with your wonderful love and light. Give us strength and courage to reflect that love and light in the world. Loving Lord, we thank you that so many have now been vaccinated and that restrictions are being lifted and life is starting to return to normal. Help us to stay vigilant and to follow the rules so that further advances can be made. Father God, this week sees the return of pupils and staff to schools. May they have found the summer break to have been one that has allowed them time to relax and prepare for the year ahead. We think of those who are starting school for the first time, moving from primary to secondary, or who have left school. All times where there is great change. Be with them as they move to a new phase in their lives. Lord God, we pray for all who work for peace and unity and for all world leaders that they will continue to seek an end to the suffering caused by war and violence, injustice and inequality, disease, prejudice, poverty and hopelessness and bring healing to the world. We pray especially for those fighting terrorism in Syria and for peace in Afghanistan. We continue to pray for those who are refugees and who seek safety in another country despite the dangers of the journey. We pray for the leaders in Europe, especially that agreement can be reached on how to cope with so many in a way that is fair and achievable, and that does not lead refugees and migrants into danger and exploitation. We remember those in Greece and Turkey who have been so badly affected by the fires in their countries. Bring them comfort at this time. Father God, we pray for our church so that each of us will make use of our individual talents, enabling us to flourish as a witness to the one body of the church. Help us all to spread the warmth of your love to everyone we meet. Help us all to appreciate the roles of each other. Gracious God, we pray for the work and service of all care homes and day centres for elderly and sick people, and for those carers who look after family and friends in their own home. And thank you for the many charity organisations who raise money and provide supportive services to help. We pray for all finding their life painful, lonely or uncertain, especially those who are ill or vulnerable. Help them to sense your comfort in times of need and bless their families and carers. We pray for all those who are struggling in their lives. Bring them hope of an end to their suffering and a resolution of their difficulties. Show us the best way to help those who suffer, without being intrusive, but without simply turning away from their pain either. Merciful Lord, your love reaches beyond the grave. We remember those who are no longer with us, and we pray for all whose life is saddened by the death of a loved one. Be with them in their loneliness. Everlasting God, we pray for ourselves as we start the week ahead. We ask that in all that we do, we may walk more closely with you at our side in the knowledge that your fatherly love and care knows no bounds. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.